Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions and talk about container gardening today. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist based here in Central Illinois on a lovely rainy day here in Bloomington. And I have two of my great horticulturist colleagues on today. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Go ahead, Ryan. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Ryan Panko, horticulture educator out of Champaign-Urbana, and uh, glad to be here joining everybody. Also on this rainy day where I'm at, close to Candace. Uh, but my uh, area of specialty or the things I like to focus on are woody plants, uh, trees and shrubs, uh, native plants, and uh, always, like Kelly, I'm a vegetable gardener and love all the veg veggies and all those kind of plants as well. Awesome. Hi, I'm Kelly Alsup, and I'm also a horticulture educator like Ryan, and I am based out of Bloomington, so I live near Candace. Yay! <laughs> My specialty is insects, and uh, um, I love talking about vegetables, and of course, I have an opinion on everything. <laughs> we'll see that come out today I'm sure <laughs> okay so if you guys have gardening questions feel free to start adding those to the comment box we're going to address any questions as they come through today but our topic specifically this week is container gardening in particular because we know this time of year we're getting close to Mother's Day and that's when a lot of people start thinking about planting their containers on the front porch and their window boxes and getting everything prettied up for the summer. So I think we're going to kick it off with Kelly, giving us some tips for uh, successful container gardens and then showing us some of the containers she's going to be doing here. Um, I would usually not recommend planting up your container pots in your bedroom, but it's rare. Yeah. So <laughs> we're going to try this here. I have um, a, a, a mixed container pot here. Um, bear with me if you can't see, but I'm going to mix uh, blue salvia. Um, this is, I'm gonna call this my pollinator pot because um, blue salvia is just amazing with the bees and uh, butterflies. And I'm going to mix it with some parsley because I'm going to let the black swallowtails eat this parsley. And then this is a I pollinate plant that we're actually um, doing research on to find out if it actually um, does promote um, pollinators. Uh, it's a beautiful plant. It's called scavola or fan flower. And so my salvia is gonna grow tall. My my parsley is going to be bushy and my scavola is going to kind of drip over the edge. So uh, one thing when you're planting is you're going to take it out of the pot. Now everybody wants to break up the roots at this point, but being a former greenhouse grower, I spent many weeks growing these roots for you. <laughs> but unless they are horribly root bound, don't mess with them at all. I'm also going to pinch off the flower, which usually gets master gardeners cringing. What? I'm doing this is because I want it to focus on root growth and not on getting this flower to open or, or pushing out more flowers. So I'm just gonna take the back edge of the pot, pop this guy in. Easy, done. Now I'm gonna take my parsley out. I'm gonna check the roots. Oh, they might be a little root bound. Woo, they're a little bit root bound. I might just take off some of the bottom rather than you know trying to break up the whole root ball. I'm just gonna take off the bottom part which will get those roots initiated and start spreading. I might actually prune off a few of the uglier leaves, even though parsley is pretty, even when it's the leaves aren't that great. This one, I have a few more flowers. So I'm going to pinch all those flowers off. I'm not gonna pinch them all off right now, but ultimately I'm gonna make sure every single flower is off because right now it's all about the roots. 
I'm gonna pull this one off. There's a little root bound at the bottom. I'm gonna just take those roots off the bottom. Not too much, not too much destruction. Go ahead and place this right here. Now, in the beginning, we're gonna uh, water this. And so I'm not gonna treat it like an entire pot. I'm just gonna give this one a little water, this one a little water, and this one a little water. And then when the, the, they actually start growing, I know that the roots are growing and then I'm going to saturate the pot and let the water come out the bottom. One thing about annuals is fertilizer really is super important. So when I do a container garden, I always do a slow release, or if you want to do a liquid feed, it's usually once every two weeks for annuals to keep them blooming. And then, you know, you deadhead the, um, the old flowers to encourage new flowers to come on. And so that's just a really simple pot using the thriller, the filler and the spiller. Kelly, we had a question about the size of your pot. How big of a diameter is that pot you're doing there? About 14 inches. Okay. And that's a good, and that's a good, good question because you can see there's space between Kelly's plants there. She hasn't crammed them so close together that there's not going to be space for those to fill out. And you know, when you buy those mixed containers in the store, they're cramming a bunch of stuff in to make it look pretty right away. But ultimately some of those plants are going to be crowded out. So, um, you know, I could even just put one of these plants in here and probably in, you know, a month, it'd be a nice full lush yep. clear pot. Yep. So, um, and you're using a and you're using a clay clay pot. It looks like. Yeah. Um, I just used what I had in my garage. That works. <laughs> that so works. I wanted to show another method of creating a container. Um, I love um, using tropicals and succulents um, in the in containers and in, in within the landscape. Um, so uh, you know, I always have crotons growing in pots on my front porch. But uh, we, uh, I recently pinched back my Wandering Jew in the terrarium that I made on the show a few months back and uh, put them in water like this and allowed the, 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 the pinchings to form roots. So I have roots right here, my cutting. And I'm just going to plant this and I'm going to plant all of these. Push your uh, camera down a little bit, Kelly, so we can see the pot. There you go. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Horticulturist, not a production person. <laughs> so I'm actually going to put, uh, you know, I'm just going to put five cuttings in here for now, but I'm actually going to put all the cuttings in there because it'll make a nice full pot faster. And then I'm going to pinch back the Wandering Jew. Give it a little bit of leaves to photosynthesize, but again, I'm working on um, reducing the transpiration and the water need so that it can form more of those roots. So I'll go ahead and put another one right here. And it was very easy to get the Wandering Jew rooted. And here I have a, a, a it, I know it doesn't look wonderful now, but it's going to look amazing. And it'll be just this nice basket of wandering jewel on my front porch in no time. And I didn't have to buy anything except soil. Nice. Well, Kelly, and I noticed you used a much uh, kind of flatter, shallower pot in that case. I'm assuming that's because it's such a hangy down kind of plant. So you don't, you don't necessarily need a, a big tall pot to frame it. It's going to kind of hang down out of that. Right. And um, just knowing when I've done uh, uh, wandering Jews, in house plants, it's okay to use a more shallow pot. Um, you know, I can, it, at the end of the season, I can always divide it or bring it inside or just take more cuttings and let that old plant go. But um, what I've noticed is that the more cuttings you can get in there, the faster it will fill in and look really pretty. 
Again, I would add a slow release fertilizer or do a liquid feed every two weeks. Um, maybe every two to four weeks for a wandering Jew versus, you know, stuff that is you're trying to get to flower. Nice. Very good. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I see we've got some um, questions coming through here. So I think let's go ahead and answer a, a couple of these questions and then I can do my container uh, demo here quick after that. So let's see what we've got here. Um, okay. So two questions from Mitch here. Um, he wants to plant some plants in his home office, but there's minimal sunlight in the room throughout the day. So he has two questions. Uh, what plants would you recommend for a space with lighting conditions like this? And then would you recommend any lighting solutions like using certain light bulbs? So house plants for a low light home office. Candace. Yes. It's crazy that he asked these questions. I was just going to pull mine out too. I have. <laughs> if you've ever heard uh, horticulturists talk about ZZ plant, this plant can take abuse. It takes low light. It takes inconsistent watering. Um, it is the excellent office plant. Um, it's a little bit more expensive because it's hard to propagate. It's usually propagated by divisions rather than cuttings. So you might have to spend, you know, 20 to $30 on a nice plant, but worth every penny hardly has any plant damage. Like, you know, when you see house plants and there's a little brown on the edge or dead leaves everywhere, this ZZ plant never has that. And it clearly it's a horticulturist favorite because Candace has one too. Yeah, I went and grabbed mine too. And mine is sitting, it's in the middle of my living room, probably 10 to 12 feet away from the window. So it, it doesn't get a ton of, ton of light moving in. Um, and the other one that I grabbed quick too was a pothos. Devil's Ivy or uh, Philodendron looks very um, similar as well. That's one that I like a lot for low light areas too. And it's more of a trailing, as you can see, trailing plant. Is that your pothos? It is. Yeah. yeah. yeah I've got one of those behind me. Yeah, this is the window here you can see. So this gets a little bit of sunlight. Um, you know, what? one that I've really liked for just really low light conditions is mother-in-law's tongue. And I wish I had a better common name for that one. Maybe yeah. dragon's tongue, I think is another name for it. But man, it'll grow yeah. in like just about um so it really doesn't take a lot of sunlight My, mine's downstairs so i'll go grab it um you know another one that doesn't take a ton of light um is the good old traditional spider plant you know and i we've got a number of those around our house um and again i probably should have probably should have more specimens sitting close to me but uh the spider plant i like it's, it's a little bit different of a variety that kind of grows around and down, down and around the pot and kind of stays a little tighter than some of them that get really spindly. But that's one that doesn't, I mean, it takes a little more light than a mother-in-law's tongue would take, but um, certainly not like a full sun type setting. Um, I think the other part of this question was on uh, any lighting recommendations mm -hmm. we give. And you know, nowadays I, I look towards that a lot more often than I used to with all the, in, the invention of all these LED options for, for lights. And the reason being, all those LED lights are a lot more energy efficient than the old tube lights um, or, or incandescent bulbs, you know, the old light bulb you think of. And, and really on an order of magnitude lower than an incandescent bulb. So from an energy efficiency standpoint, that's more of an option to me now, I feel like, than it used to be with artificial lighting. The, the thing that gets tricky in all this, and you guys may know more about this than me, I'm certainly not the expert on this, is how much light each plant needs and how it translated, translates into what a light bulb would deliver. So that's some of the question in thinking about, you, you don't want a light that's so far away from the plant where you set it that it doesn't really do anything, but um, to keep it, I don't know how to put it, but like decorative and ornamental and have it flow with your, the design of your room and everything, sometimes you don't want a light right on the plant. So I don't know, do you guys have any thoughts on how to size, you know, get the right size bulb or what might work? I think it's hard to estimate. There probably are charts out there about like how many lumens you need and, and stuff like that. But 
to me, if for the ones we mentioned, the pothos, the ZZ plant, the mother-in-laws, as long as there's a window in the room somewhere, um, you're going to be pretty good with those and any other house plant that's labeled low light when you read the tag. Uh, if you have a room with z absolutely zero sunlight, then for sure you're going to need to think about putting some bulbs on there. But for me, as long as there's at least a window somewhat nearby in the room, I don't worry too much about adding the extra lights unless there's, if I've got low light plants, but that's me. And some of those LED lights are really, really affordable. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. So, and you know, I want it to be somewhat closer to the plant. I don't want it to be so far away because I don't think the plant really um, benefits if it's too far away. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I've seen some LED lights that really, you know, that have the bendable arms and mm -hmm. can really uh, do a, a good job. But um, back to the snake plant, uh, mother-in-law tongue, snake plant is what mm -hmm. I'm um, yeah. mm -hmm. I call it the bedroom plant. And the reason I call it the bedroom plant is because it's releasing oxygen at night. And when plants, uh, photosynthesize during the day, normally plants do photosynthesize during the day. And when there's no longer sun, sunlight, they stop their respiration. But um, succulents are different. And the uh, snake plant is like that. So when I call it the bedroom plant, you're supposed to put it in your bedroom. That way you'll get more oxygen at night. However, I did research and found out that you have to have more than six. I would say, I bet it'd be a lot <laughs> to make a difference, yeah. <laughs> so go out and buy six snake plants, put them in your bedroom for more refreshing sleep. There you go. <laughs> like the low light. Well, I think that's kind of the story that the research would tell about houseplants and indoor air quality is that um, you need a lot of them. You know, it's not just one plant or two plants that does much. You, you need a ton of them uh, to do much. So something to think about. But, I, you know, if nothing else, even, even if it's not producing a ton of oxygen, it's just having those plants in close proximity and just, you know, from the standpoint of mental health and the what that does for us to be around plants and have them around us and exposed to us, that helps a ton, too. So. Another reason, yet another reason to have a, a snake plant in your bedroom. <laughs> it's all <Yep>. good stuff. <laughs> okay, excellent question, Mitch. Hopefully that helped. Um, okay, headed outside now. Question from Madeline. What is the best ratio of compost to soil for raised bed vegetable garden? And then second question, any tips for keeping basil alive? So ratio of compost to soil in a raised bed. Well, so the, the ratio I've used, and you guys can tell me if yours is different, is about a third compost to two thirds soil. But I think the question kind of also, um, it also kind of depends on what, what your soil, quote unquote soil is that you're using, because the lower quality that that is, the more I probably bump up that one third. So, so that's, that's how I've done it. What, what would you guys say as far as a mix? And it depends on what plants you're growing too. If it's a vet, if it's vegetables, then that compost is suit is needed and would be very beneficial. If it's, you know, a perennial bed, then you probably don't need the compost at all. Yeah, and, she she mentioned vegetables in her. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I don't do a specific ratio. I feel like I'm winning by adding compost. Right. That, and that's that's kind of me too. Like the raised beds I use for my cut flowers, I I probably added I don't I don't even know what the ratio was, but I started with a good quality soil, like a it's not too heavy clay, like it's a pretty good pretty good topsoil to start with, and then I essentially just top it with compost every year or, or every other year to keep kind of adding adding to it. So I had pretty good soil to start with, so I didn't. I didn't focus too much on it, but for a vegetable garden, I probably would have added a little bit more. Yeah, that's what I do at the Unity Garden in the raised beds every year. The, the you know, the soil uh, gets lower and so you have to top it off and I just top it off with compost. Yeah, that's me too. And then her second question, any tips for keeping basil alive? I have, um, I, I have an opinion on basil. <laughs> 
Let's have it. <laughs> um, what I have found is that if I plant a basil plant that I purchased from the nursery, then I'm constantly fly fighting flowers. But if I plant direct seed basil to my pots or my ground, then I have more vegetative growth. And it stays more vegetative longer. And um, so I always seed my basil. I never buy a plant anymore. Um, as far as tips for basil, um, you know, th they're extremely sensitive to cold. Mm -hmm. You need to ensure that it is above 55 degrees every day before you start to plant basil. I mean, I'm thinking late May, early June before I'm personally going to plant my basil. Um, and then the other thing is it's not going to be happy if you don't give it water. So when you think about planting seed, you want to always you know, sprinkle water on that seed because you'll always need to keep the seed wet in order for it to germinate. Once they start coming up, you can back off of the water a little bit, not water them quite as much. But then once they start getting big, then you're gonna probably have to water almost daily if it's in a container. And it's gonna be the plant that tells you that you need to water. Um, I think it's really sensitive to drought. You know what? If you get uh, basil that succumbs to drought, pull it out, reseed, start over, yeah. cut it back. Um, you can even just cut that and dry that plant, part of the plant too. I mean, you can dry, have dried herbs later too. Yeah, um, definitely. Good tip. So if, if she had specific um, problems with basil, then I could address that, but that's usually the problems with growing basil. No, that's good. I like that idea of just seeding it in. I, I tend to have better success with that too. And good tip about temperature. Definitely shouldn't be outside right now and later this week because it's going to get chilly. I know. I have to cover some of my plants. I know. Speaking of that, I'm going to scroll down because a question, I think I just saw a question come in about that specifically. Um, Deborah asked, best way to cover plants for frost, plastic or sheets. I know here in Bloomington, it's supposed to be like 31 degrees Friday night. So I know I'm thinking about the same thing. So I, any tips on protecting plants? I've never personally researched this topic, but I personally think whatever you do is going to help that plant out mm -hmm, a lot. Mm -hmm. I've noticed yeah. that my, my um, dragon wing begonias are not doing well with the cool weather and my euphorbia diamond frost. Of course, I as a horticulturist should know better than to push it, but I was trying to plant an eye pollinate demonstrate, demonstration garden um, for a video. And I was just like, well, let me see which ones do well. All the other annuals have, no, have had no problems with handling the cool weather. It's just those particular annuals, the begonias and the euphorbia diamond frost. And the same with you know, uh, pepper plants, tomato plants, those are not going to handle the cold temperatures very well. Your cool season crops are going to be fine. Yeah. As far as plastic versus cover. Either well, and the thing is, you're only going to keep it on for a short period of time. So like I have some plants in my raised beds already that probably I should cover, but I'm only going to cover them from kind of like late afternoon that day on Friday, probably until sometime on Saturday, I'll take it back off once the temperatures are back over, over that, that freezing range. So yeah, I've used just old sheets that I've had old comforters as long, if I can keep it kind of off of the plants. Um, or you can also purchase a garden center's um, floating row cover or frost blanket. Sometimes they'll call it. It's just kind of a gauzy, fabric material but yeah honestly whatever you have or you can put an upside down yeah. bucket yeah exactly yeah same thing with me i've just used whatever uh to do it but i think candace had a good point that it's kind of important to get that cover on where you still have some afternoon sun or some heat from the day to kind of build under there because whatever that you know that cover is kind of insulating that heat and trapping it there overnight is the hope um, and, and so if you can get it on a little bit during daylight hours, I know I've been guilty of putting it on after dark at the last minute, you know, as an emergency, but ideally if you can get it on beforehand, I really like the floating row covers and for individual plants, if I had tomato plants out or something, 
Um, I've used just buckets or old pots, even though they have holes that it's just creating a little bit of a barrier to break that cold. It, you're not keeping it warm and toasty like inside by any means, but just that cutting that little bit of edge off is all you need to do. Yep, exactly. Awesome question. Okay, we've got a follow up question. Kelly, you mentioned slow release fertilizer earlier. Amy asked, which slow release fertilizer do you recommend? Well, um, being an extension agent, I can't tell you the brand name. Um, so, I, you know, those little, help me out, Ryan, those little balls. Um, it's just a granular. Yeah, and it's just a slow release. Some of them are three months. Some of them are six months. I just feel like when it comes to annuals, they had, and I used to do this at the, the, uh, the, the annual trial garden I used to work at in grad school. You know, when we added um, this slow release, those slow release balls to our containers, they were so much better. Mm -hmm. And that it just breaks down over time and with temperatures. And so it just is a really great way not to forget to fertilize your annuals. And yeah. I don't think, you know, product, the specific product name or whatever is not important, but um, you know, you can just look for that that exact language of slow release because all these products are trying to advertise that. They want you to know that they went through a few special steps to make that slow release. So that that'd be my best recommendation. Just look in the product labeling and the advertising on it, and you should be able to find slow release if it is slow release. Um, and all that does, like Kelly said, it just slows down the release of those nutrients to the soil. It, it as opposed to having it all in one big burst, which you do want sometimes. I just slows it down over the, the life of that pot. So. Yeah. And keep in mind too, that whatever, depending on what kind of potting mix you're starting with, there may also be some fertilizer mixed into that, that, that kind of gets you a jump start in the season too. And that is a pet peeve of Kelly's. What, to have it already in there? I don't want it in there. I want to be the one to make the decision. <laughs> Good luck finding some that doesn't have it in there. <laughs> Yeah, I think most all of it has it, but I'm the same as Kelly. Like, I really kind of, I have a hard time interpreting from the label what was really added or how long it should last. I love how they say, like, enough food for the first two months or three months is kind of how they'll label it. And it's like, well, uh, plants don't make their food from fertilizer. You know, they make their food from photosynthesis, you know. So uh, it's kind of confusing. I, I agree with Kelly. I, I prefer the non non fertilizer added types of potting mix but um it's hard to find yeah and okay. you know it's not just it, it may not last two months if the temperatures are extremely high it is yeah. definitely or if you're watering a lot it's gonna lead yeah, to and water and temperature Ooh. are going to um, contribute to how, to how much it is released i find if you see any kind of nutrient deficiencies yellowing using a liquid feed will be your best bet to get those plants to come back to looking really healthy. It's going to be faster. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Really. That's what we used to do in the greenhouse. If we had any nutrient deficiencies, we just go through and do a liquid feed. Um, sometimes we go a little bit higher and it would almost solve the problem overnight. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to hop over to YouTube here quick. So we've got a couple questions there. Uh, Terry has a question about cilantro. He's getting ready to plant herbs and he can't seem to get cilantro to grow. So kind of like the basil, any tips for growing cilantro? Um, well, I mean, I have done it both ways. If you go into the research, you have to soak your cilantro seeds for two to three days in a glass of water. And what that does is it breaks the seed coat, breaks the dormancy of the seed. I have not done that and still had success. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be the freshness of your seeds. Um, maybe um, they're a little bit older and they need to have that. Soak them in water for two to three days before you plant them. That's the secret to cilantro. Yep, I, I concur. And I think starting them from seed is definitely better, just like the basil. And the thing about cilantro, of course, is that once the high temperatures come on, they bolt so quickly, they go to flower so quickly that the flavor, and then like you mentioned earlier with the basil, the flavor becomes different once they go to flower. So the younger you can get it started, I think the better. I have cilantro growing in a pot. I'm going to, once the, I'm gonna 
tenuously harvest once it gets warm. I'm gonna pull it all out and plant basil. There you go, there you go. And then you can plant it again in the fall if you want another, yes. another crop. Okay, and then also from Terry, I'm sure Kelly will have an opinion on this one. <laughs> what, any, what kind of drainage material for containers? Small stones, packing peanuts, Give me the download. Do we need to add anything to the container? It's a myth. <laughs> I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. <laughs> Adding rock to the bottom of your container does not improve drainage. It actually hurts drainage because of the way water moves. It, it, what it's going to do is it's going to completely saturate that soil and it's going to clean, the water is going to cling into that soil before it goes into the airspace that the rocks are creating. So actually you're doing the opposite by making the soil volume smaller and making it more saturated. I would just use a really good potting mix that, you know, when I think about potting mix, I go to my favorite growers in town and I'm like, what soilless mix do you use? I'll take five bags of that. Mm -hmm. What, especially if they grow their own plants, being a greenhouse grower, we're particular about our soil, soilless media. So, um, you know, if you have a huge, um, humongous pot and it's hard to carry around, then maybe you could put something in the bottom to prevent the the soil volume from being so heavy, but did I explain that well enough? Yeah, I think you're good. Cause I, I mean, basically what happens is if you have, let's say you have a 12 inch pot and you put three inches of rocks on the bottom, what's gonna happen is that, that water is just gonna pool right on the top of those rocks. They're not actually gonna go down into that rock like you think it's going to. So you're really limiting your, your soil area. But yeah, that's a common, common myth. I think a lot of people, Cohesion and cohesion, the way water works and soil and the water works with itself. Yep. And I think that's a good um, segue. I'm going to go ahead and do my container here. Ooh, look at that beautiful wow, container. So again, I wouldn't recommend doing this in your living room, but kind of like Kelly's bedroom, but it works. It works for this. So... Um, like we were just talking about, I have a fairly large container that sits out on my front porch and as tempting as it might be to fill that partially with something else, this is all potting mix and that's what I want. So I have a nice uh, area for those roots to grow down into. So since mine is on the front porch, I'm going to do more of a shady part sun uh, container, kind of contrast to Kelly's full sun container earlier. And I like to follow that same principles, Kelly, of thriller, filler, spiller. So in my case, I like to use grasses a lot of times as the, the thriller or sometimes even the spiller in the container. So I'm gonna be using a uh, bronzita sedge in this case for my uh, thrill. And I just love that bronzy kind of unique color to the foliage. So beautiful. Like, yeah, I love these. So like Kelly said, I pulled it out. This root system looks awesome. I'm not going to do anything to it. I'm just going to tuck it into my pot at the level that I want to. And that's going to be kind of my background pen, but also spilling over the edge. Because this is shady, um, I love ferns for containers because it's going to be in a shady spot. So I have a uh, Brilliance Autumn Fern, and this is actually a perennial. Uh, don't be afraid to mix perennials in with your annuals in the container. So what I, what I can do is have this in the pot all um, summer long, but then when it comes closer to fall, uh, and if I want to try to save this, I can actually pull it out of the pot and plant it in the ground and um, have it come back as a, per a perennial next year. So I'm starting with that uh, grass towards the back. The fern is going to kind of be my filler to add a little bit of height, but also fill in. And then I also have some plumosa fern, which would not be a perennial, it would be a tropical. But this is gonna kind of be my spiller and filler as well a little bit. So that one I'm gonna put towards the edge so it can kind of spill over and that'll kind of cascade over the, the edge. 
And then I'm, lastly, I'm gonna fill it out with just a couple of coleus. I love coleus. There are coleus that can do in sun. There are some that can do in part sun. So I'm gonna take, probably just need about two of these in here. These are just little four pack size. So they're not super, super big plants to start with. And I'm gonna put two, just two of those coleus in here. And like Kelly did earlier with the, the flowers and her plants, I am also gonna go ahead and pinch the top out of these coleus as well. Because what I want from these coleus is I want them to branch out and I want them to be a little bit shorter and bushier. And if you've ever grown a coleus in a container, if I didn't pinch it and I just left it growing like this, it'll keep getting taller and it'll bush out a little bit, but I don't want it to get taller. I want it to branch out and kind of stay nice and short and compact. And then I also come in throughout the season and continually pinch off the flowers and keep them a little bit um, shorter. And also I could always take what I pinched off too and put that in some soil, put it in some water and start another coleus plant too. So you don't have to, to toss it. Candace, I love that you demonstrated a pot that doesn't, isn't for the flowers, that textures and foliage can be just as beautiful as a flowering plant. Absolutely, yeah, that's how I tend to do a lot of my containers is different textures, different foliages, especially in shade, because it, for a shade container or a shade garden, you're limited a lot of times on the types of flowers. So if, unless you're gonna do impatience or begonias or some of the common stuff, it can be a little bit boring. So yeah, I love to use foliages and textures. And you don't get nearly the blooms you would get in full sun, just as far as number and, and display of it all in a shade plant. So yeah. yeah, really like that with the textures. Yeah, so get creative with your shade shade containers. Okay, let's deliver that container to my house. <laughs> I'll bring it right over. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, let me scroll back up here to a question. I know we've gotten some come in. Um, a question from Francis. Anyone know how to get rid of poison hemlock? So this might be a good question for our next show, too, talking about invasive species. But any, yeah. tip, any tips on poison Ooh. hemlock for now? We'll be focusing on that next time. So um, tune into our next show. We'll talk about poison hemlock and probably a lot of other invasives. But um, yeah, poison hemlock, I guess the first thing to say about that is that it has a, um, its sap or the, the liquid in the stems can have a reaction to your skin. So first thing, and any anytime you're handling it, touching it or dealing with it, wear gloves. Um, and I usually wear rubber gloves that kind of go up to my, you know, almost up to my elbow to protect from that. But um, it controls a little bit tricky in that it's a biennial. So that means it goes to seed every other year. So um, in that first year, it's much more vulnerable to chemical controls and things as opposed to the second year. Um, but a real key to it is keeping stopping it from going to seed. So uh, I've been pretty successful in places I've tried to control it by simply stopping it from going to seed. So by mowing it, hacking it down, whatever you have to do if it's a second year plant, and then just meticulously hand pulling the first year plants. And that's been, you know, I've done that because that's a more organic approach than using chemicals where um, the, the other way you could do it with chemicals involved is to actually, you know, spray those first year plants as they're coming up and, and kill them with a systemic herbicide. So those would be the, the couple different methods. Um, the biggest key though, biggest key is to keep it from going to seed. So don't let it spread spread with more seed. Awesome. Excellent. And then, yeah, like we mentioned on May 20th is going to be our next episode. We're going to have um, Chris Evans on with us and he's, he's really our invasive species expert for the state. So he will, he will have some great advice too, I'm sure. Okay. Another question here. Um, I can't seem to get my hydrangea to flower and this year looks like it did not make it. Do they make one for a shady spot? And what is the planting process? Uh, she said, I think I must have done something wrong. Same thing with bleeding heart. Help. So uh, a hydrangea for a shady spot. We talk a lot about hydrangeas. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. A load of, 
you know, my, some of my hydrangeas are just now leafing out. They're kind of slow to leaf out. So I wouldn't give up on it just yet, but. Yeah, same here. I have, um, out in my shade garden, I have some oak leaf hydrangea, which do great. That's one of my favorite types of, of hydrangeas, oak leaf hydrangea. And I also have, the, came with the house, I have some hydrangea mm -hmm. macrophylla, which are your classic kind of big round flowers that are either pink or blue. Now, how it, have I ever seen a flower on them ever in the four years I've lived here? No, um, because that's very common with those hydrangea uh, macrophylla ones. So as much as those are recommended for shade, our winters are just not ideal because they bloom on old wood and if that old growth gets killed off in the winter there goes your there goes your flowers so if it was me in a shady spot i would do oak leaf hydrangea that would be my my choice i agree i mean and if you want to look at a, if from a native standpoint if you can get the native version of our our native hydrangea hydrangea arborescence mm -hmm. and that's not as showy as its its cousin the annabelle hydrangea that does wonderful in shade. And that's where you'd see it growing in the forest. Um, less showy of a flower, but a native shrub. So it supports, you know, native wildlife and all those kind of things that are important. So um, that's a great one. And, you know, I've planted just Annabelle hydrangea in pretty shady spots um, and had a pretty good flower display from that. I have it right now on the north side of my house where it gets, you know, maybe an hour or two of sunlight as the sun sets because of the angle of my house in the sun. But for the most part, the rest of the day it's in shade and that has done really well and had a great flower display. So that's, you know, hydrangea arborescence is the genus and species and the variety is Annabelle. And there's a, a number of others that do similar, are very similar to Annabelle, but um, so yeah. Kelly, do you have something else to add? No, I think you covered it. <laughs> yeah, so, so Teresa, see if you can find out what kind of hydrangea you have, because that, that's going to make a difference in, in figuring out why it might not be flowering. But it might just be the type you have planted, that it's not, not in the right spot or it's not the right type. So, um, OK, let's see. The bleeding heart. Oh, yeah, and the bleeding heart. Same, she said same thing. Um, that one, maybe you might have too wet of a site. If you have a, a poorly, that's the only thing I can think of that maybe the, the roots are, are rotten over the winter if it's too wet. Uh, otherwise, I have plenty of bleeding heart in my shade garden and they're pretty consistent about, about coming back. What do you think, Kelly? One of the ways that you can see it, if you think that your garden is too wet is if you have like moss growing in mm -hmm. your well, that's a really good indication that you have really wet soil. And rather than try to change the soil, it, you know, just plant plants that are, will take a little bit wet condition. Yeah. Or yeah. plant it in a drier location. Yeah, I would recommend trying it in a different spot and see if you get a different, different response. Okay, question from Judy. Is there an organic way to get rid of peppermint? <laughs> an atomic bomb, right? <laughs> How do you get rid of peppermint <laughs> once it's established? It's a wonderful ground cover. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess like a lot of meticulous hand pulling. I mean, that's, that's about it that I know of maybe covering it with the tarp. Um, yeah, if you, yeah, if you covered it with cardboard or plastic or something for a, I mean, it's going to take months. It's going to take a period of time. Um, yeah. And it'll probably be growing underneath the cardboard. Probably. But yeah, hand, hand pulling, you could try to dig out as much as possible. But unfortunately, if you leave even any tidbits behind in the ground, it's going to keep, it's going to keep going. Yeah, and, and one method of digging with something like that that is that thick clump, and even this works with grass too, is just to take it about as deep of a shovel load as you can get and flip it upside down. So, I mean, you know, that, that's got to be a tough plant to deal with trying to grow backwards from the direction it was and still come up. Yeah. Uh, but that's, again, really labor, you know, really labor intensive to, to hand dig it all and turn it like that. But that can work out also. Plant your mint in a container. That's what to do. <laughs> I actually don't mind a mint ground cover. I'd rather have 
personally, I would rather have mint as my front lawn than grass. <laughs> yeah. It'd smell better. It would smell better. Right? It would. Sure would. Um, okay, another kind of aggressive plant question here. Um, I have a problem with wild onions. They're hard to pull up and they're all over the place. What do you recommend that I do to get rid of them? Also, are they edible? They smell great. I just don't want them by my rose bushes. Wild onions. Um, onions are, are supposedly a really great companion plant for roses. Um, the blooms encourage beneficial insects. Um, wild onion is edible and it actually tastes really good. Um, I actually was doing some research on wild onion a while back and all I could find was research on how to kill it. And I'm like, why would you want to kill it? Um, but um, maybe uh, Ryan can- Pretty Rose? No, I mean, when it comes to lawn maintenance, the three of us are probably not the people to ask. <laughs> Um, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, increasing your mowing height, we always tell that that'll help with weed suppression, you know, fertilizing your grass to get it to make to get it to be stronger so it can compete with some of those weeds will help it. Um, but other than just like selectively going through and digging them all out. I, I don't know what else to tell you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I have the same advice. I mean, I've just kind of lived with it at my property and, you know, mowed it or string trimmed it. And I, I feel like I've weakened it by repeatedly cutting it before it can flower and not letting it go to flower. Um, mm -hmm. But also in other areas of my property, I do let it just go to flower and do its thing. And really, um, at a certain point of the year, it's not really, you know, kind of flowers and just kind of fades away into other stuff, especially if you cut it back after that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I suppose there's a chemical control recommendation. You might have saw that, Kelly, when you ran through it. But it's just been one that um, in the grand scheme of things and all the, the problem plants I have on my property from Creeping Charlie to Winter Creeper Euonymus and English Ivy, like it's just kind of low on my hit list. So <laughs> I've got, I guess in my case, I've just got bigger problems to deal with than, uh, than Wild Onion. I kind of view it as a native that I like. I guess yeah. in my case it's in a it's in the lawn so in my case I don't worry about it either I just mow it and enjoy the nice oniony fragrance when I'm mowing <laughs> but in a landscape bed I could see how you might want to maybe try to dig it out or if it's if it is competing with other things but yeah good tip and I think you're like talking to three people that don't like the traditional lawn system um, we tend to want a diversity of plants, even if they are considered weeds, they uh, benefit the environment in a way. So, um, you know, from the girl who, uh, you know, weeds everything but the dandelions and the violets and the plantains, um, it's just, you know, having this perfectly manicured lawn is not our goal as horticulturists. And, um, I hope you, uh, you know, think about maybe not putting the resources into the lawn, but put more of your efforts into growing pretty flowers that match with the lawn. There you go. Good tips. Um, okay, we had a couple follow-up comments. Um, someone said, with that mint lawn, you're going to have all the cats in the neighborhood visiting you. <laughs> you do that. <laughs> uh, and then someone also commented that... Um, too wet is probably their issue with the bleeding heart as well. So definitely take a look at that drainage. Um, here's one. How about what can I do about rust on my Chicago figs? So they have a fig plant with rust. What would you recommend? Boy, I've had minimal luck with figs. So I'll, I'll have to defer. I don't know, Kelly, you have an idea? I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, I, I cannot give you an educated answer at this point. I'm sure there's some kind of, um, you know, preventative method, meaning don't get the plants wet or keep the plants healthy, but I'm sure there's something, usually when it comes to diseases, they're better prevented than cured, meaning, you know, get the conditions right to where rust is not happy and then you'll be much better off, but sanitation maybe. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, cleaning up the leaves that have fallen and getting better air movement through the plants. Better air movement, that's another good one. Yeah. But yeah, I've never grown figs either, so I couldn't give you a specific. I, I've tried it once. <laughs> didn't go so well, huh? It didn't make it through the winter. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I've seen them grow at the uh, Champaign County uh, Master Gardener Idea Garden. Nice. Yeah, there's a nice fig there. I've, I've successfully grown it in southern Illinois, but that's where I lived for a number of years. But now I live in central mm -hmm. Illinois, which is a climatic zone north and have not had good luck. And, um, you know, some of that relates to just the winter hardiness of the plant. It's not super winter hardy here. And I would think that just with any plant like that, the better you can protect it in the winter, the healthier it's going to be in the growing season. So, you know, just it goes along with just good plant health care that uh, maybe you could think about a little better winter protection. I guess you'd know if uh, you weren't protecting it well enough, you'd have some top top growth die back. But um, I always really try to protect the roots well, too, by insulating with a thick layer of leaves or, or mulch before the winter, just thinking if the top's not that cold hardy, the roots are probably sensitive as well. So maybe it could gain you some edge of plant health by protecting the roots a little better in the wintertime and, and hoping for the best. But um, yeah, good question. Yeah, awesome. Okay, we got another herb question here. Uh, I'm growing herbs and veggies indoors, but for some strange reason, the oregano is taking longer to sprout and the spinach keeps dying after sprouting. What are your thoughts? Why are you growing it indoors? <laughs> Put it well, out there. I would assume to get a quicker start in the season, but yeah, like, like Kelly's asking that question, I, I tend to plant spinach just direct seed and usually have pretty good luck. So that may be a solution is the spinach. I'm not sure on the oregano. Yeah, I've um, never, I've never tried oregano from seed. I've always just purchased a small plant and it's perennial. So mm -hmm. it always comes back every year. So I, yeah, I've never tried that from seed either. Um, just, uh, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, transitioning your tramps plants that you're growing inside to the outside you want to you know transition them uh don't just put them you know plant that don't just take them out of your basement and plant them directly in the ground give them some time outside um start with you know during the day for a couple of days then maybe uh, overnight in the shady location and then transition them to the full sun you gotta you know when you buy uh, plants from the garden center, they're already hardened up, but when you're starting seed on your own, you need to be sure you're hardening those up before you plant them out outside. But again, with what Ryan said, um, spinach is super successful from direct seed into a pot or the ground that you really don't need to start starts of that. Um, and yeah, I've never tried to grow seed, oregano from seed either. So um, maybe it just takes a long time to germinate. Maybe it has some sort of uh, seed requirements. I I would Google, you know, uh, starting seed and see if any universities have tips on, you know, like with the cilantro, the soaking or yeah. with beet seeds, the pre-sprouting. Oh, yeah, or just purchase a small starter plant to start with if you if you don't want to take the time. Yeah. You can even divide well, and great, Yeah, and great point that it's perennial. I mean, it's a great one to get started outdoors and, and you have it forever. You know, it's coming back nicely in our herb garden this year. Yeah, me too. And I even had it in a, I left it in a container outside for the winter and it still, still came back. So it's pretty tough. I'm growing okay. thyme as a perennial in my front bed. So I have another one. That is a good one. Perennial herb that is fun to grow, thyme. Good ground cover too, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. So I'm trying to get through these last couple of questions. Um, back over to YouTube. Terry has a question about gardenias. Uh, love gardenias and I know how finicky they can be. I was going to buy a gardenia tree. How do you plant it and care for it? I wouldn't plant it. Yeah, it's. I would treat it as a, as a house plant because it's a tropical tropical plants. So if it was me, I would pot it like you would any other house plant and maybe put it outside for the summer, but certainly you're going to have to bring it in and have it as a house plant in the winter. That's what I would do. As a person who grows lots of plants, 
Gardena is not one on my list because I, if it's hard and difficult to grow, I'm not down with that for some reason. I'm with you. Um, you know, uh, I used to grow gardenia in the greenhouse and it, it, it looked okay. It wasn't as ornamental as some of the other plants. I know why she likes it. Maybe the, the nostalgia of the blooms and the smell, and it is a wonderful smell, but, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, something else that smells good. Can you think of something else that smells good that would be easy to grow? Maybe jasmine would be oh, see, a I just easier. I just picked up some jasmine when I was shopping for those plants and I'm going to do that in containers. Um, but yeah, being from the Midwest, we're probably not the experts on gardenias, but... Um, yeah. Um, okay, last couple of questions here. Follow-up question about my container. Um, is maximum four hours of direct sunlight too much for that shade garden, which you just made for us? It depends when, if that's bright, direct afternoon sun for four hours. Uh, for some of the, like those ferns, they may not love that. They would probably survive, but they may get a little, a little bit too much sun. It just depends when that direct sunlight is hitting it. Uh, Justine asks, and we can probably get this follow-up information, um, is the plant, Urbana Plant Clinic open to drop off a sample? Do you guys remember from Diana's last, Diane's last update? She wants you um, to email her first. She doesn't want you to drop off samples. She wants you to email and try to solve the problem over email because she needs to focus on, you know, really high priority plant problems and work with the industry, but she's more than willing to, you know, try to diagnose over the email. Well, perfect. And Erin just dropped in the link for you there. So check out that link and that should have instructions on what they're doing. Okay, last two questions. Uh, my vine roses stopped growing all of a sudden. They were growing very well for several years. And they said, especially Joseph's coat. So that must be a variety of vine rose. Um, what do you think? They stopped growing all of a sudden. <laughs> I know we're all in. Like, well, well, I mean, honestly, it, I wouldn't. They picked, they picked our other Achilles heel. <laughs> roses right on, and now we have roses where we're all three like uh uh <laughs> i wouldn't attribute it to winter damage because we had a fairly i mean i don't know where this person is located but at least around here um it wasn't too severe of a of a winter so i would just see if any other conditions have changed in that site if maybe the there's more water than usual in that area or if, if something else has changed um yeah, that's a tough one without being able to, to know if anything's changed or if there's any disease symptoms. Could they prune it and get new growth? You could. And it's still early too. You could prune it back and, and see if you're, if you're going to get growth, it's going to come from the base probably. So prune it back and see. Sorry, roses are not our <laughs> specialty either. <laughs> Okay, and then I'm going to finish it off with one question because I know it's going to come up a lot and we're working on some information. Uh, but Kelly, let's see if you want to give any information about the murder hornet that is in the news as of late. You know, I saw one news thing on it and I can't really explain it. Um, I haven't done the research. I know that they're going to write an article in the Home Garden and Pest newsletter on it. I, I don't even know where it is. So I, I'm sorry, I haven't been keeping up with the news on that. I have heard about it, <laughs> um, but uh, look for the upcoming Home Yard and Garden Pest newsletter. Cause I think Sarah said she was gonna write an article on it. And maybe if Ryan has heard something about it. Uh, no, but it's definitely all over the news, and I'm curious. And I, really, I just noticed yesterday uh, some Master Gardener emails kind of going around discussing it in our group and thought, what's a murder hornet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like you, I read a quick article on it, so I don't know enough to say much, but I will definitely be interested to see what the um, Home Yard Garden and Pest Newsletter says about it. That's our extension expert on this, so um, it'll be interesting to see what Sarah writes, and she'll she'll tell the whole story, that's for awesome. sure. 
these guys. Yeah, the article I read it was from Washington, which is where they where they identified it. So uh, we're a ways from Washington, luckily at the moment. So we'll try to get that uh, link to the Home Yard Garden Pest newsletter in the comments because that'll be that's where it's going to be when we get Illinois information. So and I think you have to be stung several times before it murders you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a horrible name. <laughs> but not, not as serious as it as it as it seems I don't think okay well thank you everybody you guys rocked it with the questions today really great questions we're going to be back on on May 20th with Chris Evans who's our uh history specialist and our interim master naturalist coordinator uh and he's going to touch on anything you want to know about invasive species he's excellent um expert at that so we hope we'll in about two weeks on the 20th but thank you everybody for joining today uh we hope you're out there gardening and you're doing a lot outside in your gardens we appreciate it bye, bye. bye. See ya.